So the first session will begin with uh, a talk by uh, Professor Manasvita Bose. Uh, she is a faculty member uh, in the Energy Science and Engineering Department of IIT Bombay, and she is also a co-PI, I um, mean co-principal investigator of the Open Forum project of uh, FOSI IIT Bombay. So over to you, Manasvita ma'am. Uh, you can begin the session, and the talk will be on laminar flow through a pipe. So over to you, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. You are familiar with laminar flow through a pipe and perhaps also channel. I'll take you through these example problems, highlighting some salient features. Needless to say that you can stop me at any point for discussion, wherever you have any doubt, just stop me, okay? Yeah. Now the learning objectives uh, are three. One is to connect to the basic form of the conservation laws, to discuss laminar flow through channel and pipe. And the reason I have intentionally taken both problems, channel and pipe, is pictorial representation, schematic representation for both are exactly the same. However, they're different. And I wanted to highlight at this point. I, I wanted to highlight this point. And then we will discuss a sample problem using a simple wage mesh. So these are the tasks for this session. Now, when it comes to our mind, laminar flow, to be precise, low RE flow. And any idea why I said it is low RE flow to be precise? Because it is laminar flow, ma'am. Yes. So that there is a low Reynolds number flow. So we are saying a low RE. Okay. So what happens if the Reynolds number is infinite? If suppose if an ideal flow, ideal fluid flows through a pipe, will the flow be laminar? Yes, ma'am. Ideal fluid flow will be laminar. So that's why these equations are to be precise. These equations are for low RE flow. Yes. So when it comes to uh, us, uh, our mind, the, the low RE flow, the equations that this is these equations are through pipe. The axial velocity is a function of radial position, and that is an that is a representation of fully developed flow. That is the velocity does not change with axial position. Maximum velocity is given minus dp dz. The minus sign, of course takes care of the negative pressure gradient. The flow is driven by the pressure gradient and R squared by four mu. Delta P is 32 mu LV by D squared. And delta P can be reorganized, rewritten in form of a couple of non-dimensional numbers and where F is the friction factor, which is 64 by RE. This is the set of equations that comes to our mind. Exact schematic representation for a channel flow However, the equations change. Here x is the flow, here x is the cross flow direction. I should have drawn it. X is the cross flow direction. So u z is the flow direct z is the flow direction. U z as a function of x. U max is one minus x square by h square. H is the half channel width. U max is given as minus partial p partial z h square by two mu. Here u max is three by two, that is one, 1. 1.5, one and a half U average. So the difference here, it was U average is twice U max here, U, sorry, U max is twice U average here, U max is one and a half times of U average. Delta P is two mu L U max by H square. If we write in terms of U average, it is 12 U mu, U, 12 mu, L U average by A square. A is the total channel width. H is the half channel width. So there is a difference. And why is this difference? What is this difference due to? The difference is due to the RDR effect. Okay. As we move from the, as we move along the radial direction, the area increases in case of pipe because of this RDR effect. Though the schematic representation is exactly the same, planar view is exactly the same, equations are different. And that we can see from the Cartesian form of the governing equation and the 
the governing equations in the polar coordinate. And that is the connect I wanted to make. Now, basic form of the equations. First thing, the basic form of equations that we solve is mass and momentum conservation equation. And the assumptions that we make is fluid is a continuum. And I'm sure you would have discussed all these things in yesterday's, yesterday's session. So I will very quickly go past it, okay? When we say fluid is a continuum, what decides whether fluid is a continuum or not? It is not and number, which is defined as the ratio of the mean free path to the system, uh, mean free path to the system length scale. And mean free path to the system length scale has to be less than one. What does it mean? Suppose we consider in the flow domain, we consider a tiny volume. What is this tiny? What does this tiny volume mean? Hello? The tiny volume, which is a point refer refers to an infinitesimal volume. On that point, the average field variables are determined. However, this point contains, this infinitesimal volume contains a large number of molecules. And this is a small exercise I always like to do to give an idea. I'm, I, I do not know whether you have come across this exercise before, but if not, then maybe it's a good idea to take half a minute or so of break to do this exercise. Suppose if you have an imaginary cube of one micron aside, okay? Hmm? Cube of one micron aside, and at normal temperature and pressure, which is 273 Kelvin and one atmospheric pressure, can you say how many molecules of ideal gas is there in the volume? A quick calculation. We know that one mole is contained in 22.4 liter, right? One mole occupies 22.4 liter and one mole is Avogadro number. Can we do this quick calculation? I don't know. You want the accurate number, but, but just an order of magnitude value. What kind of number we get? Are we doing these calculations? I think when it is 10 to the power 16. 10 to the power 16? One micron cube and 22.4 liter, 22.4 liter meaning one, one, one liter is one decimeter cube. Okay, if we do these calculations, we see that th this cube contains 10 to the roughly about 10 to the power seven molecules, order of magnitude analysis. Now, if a small volume contains these many molecules, so we have enough number of molecules to calculate the average property. So these points, these points represent average properties, averaged over what? Averaged over the molecules, right? And then we get the field variables, which we, which we use in all our macroscopic equations, that is, you know, the field variables, which pressure, temperature, density, velocity, etc. And how else we can see? Suppose when we measure the properties. Suppose if we had the sensor probe, which the probe was of the size of the mean free path, then we would see the fluctuations which are seen here. Okay, But if the probe is of the size of larger than the mean free path, these fluctuations wouldn't be seen. So when, if we are in this region where the molecular fluctuations are not seen, we can say that we are in the continuum regime. And that means that's a number is much less than one. This is the formal definition of continuum. We always say that fluid is a continuum. Okay. Now, when we have established fluid as a continuum, then the other thing we have to do is we have to write down the mass and momentum conservation equation for fluid. Now, Mass and momentum conservation equation we have been writing for ages for a system which is like dm dt of system is zero. This is the total derivative, this is the ordinary derivation. This says that mass cannot be created or destroyed. And this is Newton's second law of motion where we say that rate of change of momentum is the sum of rate of change of momentum of the system is sum of the forces acting on the system. These two things we know, but we have to write them in terms of the 
we have to write them for fluid and when we say if we are writing it for fluid we write it for the control volume and this is how when we write the ordinary derivative for the system on the control volume this is the conversion this is the transformation okay the ordinary derivative there is a partial derivative and there is a flux term i am not going through the derivation but i am going to give you the physical interpretation again you may have seen this in the previous lectures i'll go through it very quickly the partial derivative term tells you that if we focus at the control volume and this is eulerian approach so if we focus at the control volume what is happening at the control volume with respect to time alone that is the definition of the partial derivative and the flux term tells you that if we focus at the control volume what is the net what is the net influx what is the net inflow of the property so you know we are talking about the mass and the momentum Hello. yes ma'am uh, in the noise transportation theorem this is the renault transportation theorem right absolutely so, so uh, what is the system here means it is it is the control volume which is the system or something else is the system what is the system in this renault's transportation theorem no renault see system is um system is a def defined mass okay, okay so how we define the mass in the uh, okay. control volume because... just give me one second i can you see my yes. screen now yes. okay so yes. i will define the system and control volume okay so system you see this dark region yes okay this is system system is a quantity of mass okay mm -hmm. a region in space which you have selected for the study this is the system control volume is something which is a properly selected region in space so this this circle thing you are seeing here yes yes where i am using my cursor this is the control mm -hmm. volume so system is a defined mass this one is the system which can move okay which is flowing right you see that this is flowing mm -hmm. so at some point of time say it was somewhere here then at time t it came and occupied the control volume and then it has left and it is going out it is partially it has partially left and then at some some other time it is completely left and it has gone out this is the relationship between system and control volume so ma'am my confusion is in the continuous flow when the, there is sorry? a continuous flow sorry so my confusion is in the ha. continuous flow can hmm. i visualize the system means there is a continuous flow we cannot see yes, it like can. you you can you imagine you are sitting in front of a continuous flow okay some open okay. channel flow or some flow through a pipe where you can see okay, okay. now you imagine you have used a dye and you have dyed a fluid uh, you have dyed some fluid element okay that you can track okay, okay. that becomes your system Hmm? now you are focusing at some point so that system that dyed particles that dyed fluid particles come hmm. occupy that your control volume and leaves you can keep continuously okay. see you can visualize okay. it you know you sit in front of a river you see that okay mm -hmm. okay okay you can okay. you can Thank check you. in in the lab you know if you have a transparent pipe you can visualize it Hmm. right and this is precisely what is the depiction of renolds transport theorem that it hmm. comes occupies at some time t is equal to 0 it has occupied at time t plus delta t it has left so it has left some volume in between and it has occupied some new volume and this is that you know that uh, a dn dt where n is the generalized property dn dt of the system when we calculate this is what is the physical description of the renolds transport theorem okay okay, okay. thank you yeah. now this mass rate of change of masses of the system is zero and this is the this is what when we write in on the control volume and here is the momentum conservation so rate of change of momentum on the rate of change of momentum of the control volume is the sum of the forces acting on the control volume these are the two equations that we are going to deal with rate of change of mass of the control volume is zero rate of change of momentum of the control volume is the sum of the forces acting on the control volume okay 
Now these are the two equations, but this is the integral form. We have to use the differential form. For that, we are using, we are taking, making use of the Gauss divergence theorem. And one more thing we have to do, we have to write force in terms of the stress. Okay, surface force we have to write in terms of the stress. This is a second order tensor, which again, I think you have gone through in the previous lecture. So I will go through it in detail, right? Now, after we do a little bit of algebra, we get the, uh, we get the familiar form of the mass and the momentum conservation equation. We still have kept the shear stress term. Here we will be using the constitutive relationship, which is for the Newtonian fluid. And for incompressible fluid, we will be having that divergence of u is zero. We'll set this to zero. So shear stress is mu into grad u plus grad u transpose. Now, what is uh, incompressible fluid? Incompressible fluid, we say we define in terms of Mach number, which is the ratio of the velocity of the fluid to the velocity of sound in the same medium. This is important in the same medium. And if it is, if my Mach number is less than 0.3, it is a convention, less than 0.3, we say we will be considered in, in, incompressible. That is, change in density with respect to pressure is negligible, okay? This is the interpretation. With that interpretation, we go ahead. And if we use this, if we substitute this expression for tau, we get this particular equation, rho partial u partial t plus rho u dot grad u is equal to minus grad p plus rho del square u plus rho g. And this is the form of the equation that you know. So for incompressible equation, we have del dot u is zero and mu del square u these two equations form the complete set of equation. Of course, because we have this differential equations, nonlinear and second order, we need boundary conditions and there are different types of boundary condition. You can define the value of the variable itself. That means we can define the value of the velocity itself at the wall. We can define the gradient at the wall. And for heat transfer, of course, this is not for fluid flow. Heat transfer, there is another different, uh, another boundary condition. We'll not discuss that. Now coming to the, this is the background. Okay? The background of the problem. Now coming to the user point of view. How do we define a problem? Now we will define a problem and we will solve it. Okay, so the problem definition is simulate the velocity profile of an incompressible Newtonian fluid, Newtonian fluid flowing at a steady state through a horizontal pipe with circular cross section. Okay, now if this is the problem statement that is given to you, what are the input, what are the uh, information that one should know? We should know the pipe diameter, length, properties of the fluid, and velocity and the volume or the volumetric flow rate of the fluid. Something we should know. Okay, now then properties of the fluid. Okay, now one more thing I should have written here for analytical solution. If we need to get in to get to any analytical solution, we should make one assumption here that the fluid is that the flow is fully developed. Okay, that's what I have written here. See, when we are writing the boundary conditions here, we said okay, at the wall it is no slip condition. That means fluid assumes the velocity of the solid at the wall. And we have written the boundary condition at the inlet and the outlet. Inlet, we have said for analytical solution, if you want to get an analytical solution, because you know, unless we simplify the equation, we cannot get any analytical solution. So for analytical solution at the inlet also, we assume that it is fully developed flow. So what does, what does fully developed flow mean? Fully developed flow means, yes. So velocity profile will not change further. Means it will remain same. Right. Yeah, so, so that, yeah. Absolutely. So that means, suppose if this is the z direction, that means duz dz is going to be zero. Yes. Right. So that duz dz is going to be zero at this boundary is the gradient condition being satisfied. Right. We are defining the gradient of the 
velocity at this phase. And at the other phases, we are saying velocity itself is e, right? Okay. Now, if we define uniform boundary, uniform flow here, which is for numerical solution, which is possible, we can we can simulate the developing region. Then this is here for a 2D case, it is going to be a 2D flow here. We can determine the developing length or entry length, okay, which is possible for numerical solution. Now, with this problem statement, we know the governing equation. Boundary conditions are set. Now let us try to get the analytical solution because you know, uh, as a first step, when we are learning some numerical technique or some software, in this case, we are not getting to get, we are not going to get into the numerical methods. We'll straight get into the software. So when we are learning some software, it is better to have some analytical solution at hand so that we can compare the results. So we'll start with the analytical solution. You know, here I have written the Z component of the momentum conservation equation. I forgot to mention, look at this, momentum conservation equation is a vector equation. So that means it has three components. I have written, here we have written only the Z component of the equation because other two components are not relevant. You see, it is axisymmetric through a pipe. It is an axisymmetric uh, flow, we can always assume. And R momentum component, there is no flow in the R direction. So the R momentum component doesn't come into picture. So the most relevant component is the Z momentum component. Uh, Z component of the momentum, okay? So assumptions are incompressible Newtonian flow, a fluid given in the state problem statement, steady state, axisymmetric pipe flow, laminar we have assumed. So UZ is only non-zero component is UZ, URU, and U theta are zero, fully developed for analytical solution. We have made this assumption. Constant transport properties, that means rho and U are constant and horizontal GZ is zero. We are not considering gravity. Mass conservation trivially satisfied and Z component of momentum conservation we have written. Now we can see it in both ways. One is because, you know, all because of all our assumptions, the left hand side of the equation is zero. That means it is not an accelerating flow. And if the flow is not accelerating, the forces have to balance each other. So there is this pressure force and there is this shear force. So forces have to balance each other. And that is how I think even in any textbook have any textbook starts so they they use they write these two terms right so you can relate to that and when we write this this is then algebra and application of boundary conditions we get the form of the uh, velocity profile with under all these assumptions a similar exercise one can do for the channel and i'm not See, this is in the Cartesian coordinate system. So the form of the equation changes. However, the principle remains exactly the same, that forces have to balance for a non-accelerating flow. And when the forces balance, you, we get the exact, we get very similar equation and we solve it. We get a slight, we get a different form. Definitely here, this R dr effect is not there. Okay. So we get set of equations for the channel. Now, Flow through channel, open form. I think there is a tutorial uh, hands-on session after this, and they will be taking it. I will I will show you a demonstration for flow through pipe. Okay. So discretization in, when we take it through, when we take the numerical route, then first we have to discretize the equation, creation of geometry, creation of mesh, mesh, assigning the boundary conditions, selection of properties, selection of solver setting the convergence criteria and analysis of results, okay? Now, see, when we talk about pipe, we said it is axisymmetric geometry, right? If it is axisymmetric geometry, then do we really have to solve a 3D problem? What do you think? Not necessarily. No, the problem is axisymmetric. Sorry? And we have to solve... When problem is axisymmetry, then we have to solve only one section. Another section will we'll give same result. Absolutely. So in case, and, and because it is finite volume method, we have to, there has to be a tiny volume we have to solve. So here we can solve a wedge shift geometry, which is, you know, a delta theta, right? A conical shape geometry or a, or a wedge shape geometry. That's what we can solve, right? 
now if you see in the in the in the file which you are now familiar with in a in a case file there are some basic uh, directories right system constants and zero the initial condition right and in system we have the blush, block mesh deck in that block mesh deck you we have to define our geometry for the simple thing right and here there we define the vertices so here you see we have defined it's a cartesian coordinate system using the vertices we have created a geometry like this which is a wedge shaped geometry you know this is my very poor effort of plotting these points and trying to show you the geometry see the first point is 0 0 and the second point is 0.4995 some number and 0.02181 and that is how this then the third point has been created the fourth point is here and then fifth and sixth point are there like that the points are created there are nine points okay now once we do the meshing this is the simple grading system so there is the see the uh, the wall is in the in the radial direction so a grading in the mesh is there in the y direction in theta direction there is no there is only one mesh so scaling factor is one in the r in the flow direction we said okay let it be uniform mesh so simple grading with this kind of mesh stretching ratio and these are the number of mesh number of grids in each direction okay once the blocks are created block mesh is run we hear the boundary conditions inlet is patch outlet is patch and walls are created there is a wedge or types of boundaries are assigned and then we have to run the block mesh once we run the block mesh you know if it runs successfully you get this kind of a uh, you get this you get to see that you know it ends successfully there is this end comment okay after that you see this is the generation of the mesh and this is the wedge shaped mesh and this is what i meant that there is a 0.5 stretch ratio so the smallest size to the largest size is 0.5 and in the other direction this is the flow direction here it is one all of them are uniform and in the theta direction there is only one cell so is the geometry clear now this is the r direction radial direction in the radial direction there is a gradation there is a expansion ratio near the wall this is the wall this is the wall near the wall this is the smallest mesh okay near the center this is the largest mesh smallest mesh to the largest mesh the stretch ratio is 0.5 and that's what we have defined if you have seen we have defined 1.51 this is that 0.5 this is the uniform mesh in the flow direction now in a laminar flow we really don't expect much to happen so you know gradients to move smoothly rather so that's why in the uniform this in the flow direction it is uniform mesh and in the z direct in, in the theta direction there is only one cell so this is also one this is how the mesh looks like right after the mesh we have the in the constant directory we have the transport properties transport properties you see we have to define only new here we have to we have to keep in mind in open form we don't we 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 define only kinematic viscosity right right that is mu by rho okay what is the dimension if we use si meter, meter square, square per second okay now looking at this number which is the fluid i mean which is the fluid we are using here looking at this number this is water water this is water okay so this is the new we have to specify and after we have specified we have to give the velocity we have to define the boundary conditions here we have given the boundary conditions see this is the uniform we said we know in, in numerically we can define uniform bound 
velocity is also so in the flow direction we said it is 0.025000 other two components are zero outlet is zero gradient so that means duz dz is or dux dx is zero walls are no slip so this is the boundary conditions we have supplied okay now start time end time and you know i think down below somewhere convergence is there which i did not show you can check this control dict file start time end time delta t is that these are the things to play around okay we can change we can change the end time we can change the delta t so that to check the time convergence and all this after we run the simulation we have to go to para view and here comes the analysis so the you know i have roughly about 5 minutes time to complete and in that time i will show you the analysis part so first thing we have to plot the velocity as a function of radial position now where do we plot it see we know that we started with a uniform see this is the length of the pipe section right that wedge section and we know that we started with that uniform inlet condition and we expect the flow to develop right we expected the flow to develop so where should we plot it at the inlet condition or closer to the outlet condition or at different axial location i would suggest that when we say start the uh, exercise we plot at different axial position and see how the flow profile changes it will start from a very uniform profile to a flat profile to a developed parabolic profile okay please do this exercise i have plotted somewhere close to the exit and it looks like a parabolic profile now how do i know that i am getting a correct results you remember we gave an uniform velocity profile which was 0.025 meter per second and here look the maximum velocity i am getting somewhere close to 0.05 so that, that is twice the average velocity and that's what one would expect in pipe flow okay and then the other thing we have plotted is the center line velocity center line velocity what i have plotted against center line velocity i have plotted against the axial distance right so you see center line velocity is increasing from 0.025 to 0.05 so now one can check check where it is attaining the maximum velocity that is center line velocity where it is where it is attaining the maximum velocity that is 0.05 look at the graph and check what is the number where it is attaining the maximum velocity you could get that actual position from the graph and you can calculate the reynolds number see you know the average velocity which is 0.0 which is 0.025 now 0.025 is the average uh, is the average velocity diameter we know because we have specified the diameter here here we can see the half we can see the radius which is 0 0.0045 so 0 0.005 is the radius right so the diameter is 0 0.01 so 0 0.01 is the diameter 0 0.025 is the average velocity one can calculate the reynolds number and 10 to the power Minus six is the new. So, what is the Reynolds number? Anybody calculating? Two fifty is the Reynolds number, right? Okay. If two fifty is the Reynolds number, what is going to be the entry length for laminar flow? The entry length is L by D is equal to point zero six LE. One could check these calculations from the you no know, check. Go back to the textbook and check these calculations whether i am getting the correct result and then the next thing with the developing length one can plot the pressure drop one is in the developing region pressure is going linear that means pressure drop is constant this is one check the second check is pick up two points and put the pressure drop value or put the pressure value this is calculate the delta p calculate the delta p from 32 mu l v by d square this is another exercise and check whether we are getting the values close enough or not okay so this is where one analyzes the result and cross checks if if it is not correct then goes back and what does they what do they do refine the mesh if it is laminar flow refine the mesh and if it is turbulent flow depending on the problem they look at the problem set up problem formulation and with that i come to the end of the 
I think my time is also up. Yeah, discussion that low RE flow through a pipe and channel is discussed. Implementation of low RE flow through a pipe is it on open form is discussed in analysis of results from simulation. How do we analyze the result that has been discussed? And I acknowledge Mr. Ashley Melvin for creating the wedge shaped geometry. Uh, he was part of uh, FOSI. And I thank all of you. Okay. If there are questions, we'll just take it. How can we make wedge shape geometry in web open form? Okay, so let me go there. See, these are this is that block mesh dict file. We have to, yes, uh, huh? and this is how we have created the. This is a simple thing. This is how we have created the vertices. Okay, and here we have used the scale factor of 0 0.01. Okay, you can use. Any other scale factor, you can use any other numbers. You can play around with this number. I can share this file with you so that you can play play around this number. So these are the vertices. This is how we have created the vertices. And then what we have done is we then the hex mesh is created that you know the vertex are joined to create the surfaces. Number of breeds in each block is specified in each direction is specified and what kind of grading is required that is specified here. So once this is done, then the boundaries are assigned. And this is how we created the wedge shaped mesh in the uh, in open form. Okay, ma'am. Can you share this file, ma'am? I will. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Ma Ma'am, I have a small doubt. You said the pipe, we are considering it as a circular pipe. <laughs> and how is it going to match the original uh, dimension, ma'am? Like it's, you are considering a wedge shape. And yeah, but, the, yeah. in, uh, but the pipe which you are considering is a circular one. So how does it give the accurate resolution for uh, this kind of a mesh, ma'am? I, I, I'm not able to... Okay so, so, uh, okay, so do you have a piece of paper and a pen with you? Yes, ma'am. Ah, okay, so draw a circle. Yeah, okay. Okay, so at any and any angle, so okay, this is axis symmetric, right? Yeah. Ah, so at any angle, draw some delta theta. Yeah, okay, ma'am. So, so and, and this pipe, you have, you know, this pipe, you have the length and all that remains unaltered, right? Yes, ma'am. So if you, instead of doing a full circle 3D pipe, if you just draw this wedge-shaped thing, R is okay. not altered, length is not altered. Okay. You're just simulating only this delta theta part. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. I get it. I get it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, ma'am, there is one more question from Siddhi Vinayak. He's asking yeah. why you have used expansion ratio in radial direction and not in other Sorry. direction. Sorry? Why you have used expansion ratio in radial direction, but not in other direction? Okay, so see in radial direction, because there is wall effect in the radial direction. Wall is there Can in the radial direction. Could you explain direction? what is the wall effect? Okay, so see gradient direction here is the radial direction. Right. There is no gradient in the Z direction or axial direction. That's why we have used uniform grade in the axial direction and uh, stretch ratio in the wall direction and finer grid close to the wall. What okay. is uh, stretch ratio? Stretch ratio. See, can you see this? Can you see my uh, slide? See, this is, this is the radial direction. Okay. Yeah. Hmm? This, now see the difference, the, the size of this grid and the size of this grid, this is different, right? Yeah. So this smallest to the largest is the, is the ratio, that ratio we have used 0.5. That is, I think they call the stretch ratio. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ma'am, one more question in the chat. Someone mm -hmm. is asking to explain boundary condition for velocity and pressure. Okay. What we have done here is we have used the boundary condition as fixed value 
uniform boundary and uniform velocity at the inlet and zero gradient that is fully developed condition at the outlet we did not use a pressure condition pressure is uh, uh, pressure will but pressure will get adjusted and no slip at the wall that is the boundary conditions we used you can use a pressure outlet see if you don't want to use a if you are unsure of its fully developedness and all you can use a pressure outlet condition but we did not use a pressure outlet condition there hey madam uh, could you explain once again why we have to use finer mesh in the wall near to the wall see the gradient direction is the radial direction right in this case flow direction there is of course in the developing region there is some gradient but beyond that it, it we are setting the uz dz to be zero in the fully developed region there is no gradient so if you uh, take the derivative okay uz ur what do you get minus 2r by r square right duz dr is minus 2r by r square so again the gradient is zero at the center and maximum at the wall so that means the changes in velocity with respect to the position is maximum at the wall right so that if you want to pick up you have to have finer grid there okay that's why we have we are using finer grid closer to the wall right okay uh, i'll i'll tell you i'll give you one uh, you know small thing you have a piece of paper with you and pen yeah, yes ma'am acha draw a function uh, somewhere it is flat and somewhere it is slightly steep slightly steeply varying okay so where it is flat you can take a larger gap right in within the larger gap it is piece wise linear yes but where it is sharply varying your gap has to be small your delta delta in the independent variable has to be small for to yes. assume the dependent variable to be linear yeah the slope will be very high right that is what you are meaning so that's what i'm saying here that you know here the variation in of uz with respect to r is large near the wall as compared to it is near the center so near oh. the wall it is fine grid as compared to near the center and now now i understood madam thank you thank you so much yes can anyone tell me if there are any other question in the chat um, there is one more question from roshan he is asking whether you can use mass flow inlet or mass flow outlet boundary condition mass flow inlet is possible mass flow outlet he can check whether he is getting the fully developed i i need to check before i say mm -hmm. for this kind of situation i always use fully developed it should develop it should develop to uh madam just one general question so yeah. this uh, um, the finer mesh at the wall is this uh, will it be this case for almost like all the general flows yeah yes yeah because on almost all example like when we like the professors were sharing the screen like it was observed that near to the wall the meshes will be always finer yes yes that you can like you know this is one thing you can is you know, i always want to capture the wall effect okay so is there any other question like you know is there anything in the chat wall effect means wall shear stress ma'am wall shear stress in case of uh, you know see at the wall what happens is velocity is becomes zero right and then the gradient is high so that you want to resolve okay ma'am uh, satyanarayan is asking uh, about the boundary condition that you have implemented in axial direction sorry uh, boundary condition that was implemented in axial direction boundary conditions in the axial direction yes yes ma'am also at the wall like no slip at the wall Yeah, yeah. Also at the wall in radial and axial direction. He's asking, uh, like every every phase, we have to give the boundary condition. 
madam uh, again a follow up question uh, so this wall effect is it something generally people just refer in papers like y plus is equal to something one or something turbulent like that flow. that is for turbulent flow okay i have yes, a uh, minor question here uh sometime at outlet we use pressure gradient and sometime we use zero uh, zero pressure or i mean uh, a constant pressure so is there any specific conditions where we should be choosing out of these two at the outlet that when we should use zero pressure gradient or when we should use constant pressure boundary condition at the outlet zero velocity you mean zero velocity gradient or constant pressure no 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 at outlet sometime we use zero pressure gradient and sometime we use a pressure uh, a constant so zero is there any specific criteria of where we should zero out of this pressure thing? gradient you use zero yeah, pressure gradient. dopi by do n equal to zero at outlet sometime we use like that isn't it or okay. if i am wrong please uh, correct me okay uh, zero pressure gradient is something i need to check okay constant pressure you can most of in, in the, the the pressure outlet condition is the most general thing you don't really have to assume anything okay if you are uh, when you are completely sure that your uh, flow will be fully developed you can use a zero velocity gradient zero pressure gradient is something i'll just check unless there is a velocity driven flow i'm not sure where you are using a zero pressure gradient i'll just check and i'll tell Yeah. No. For example, let's take an example of, uh, of a flapping wing. So, if you are simulating such kind of a flow, you you'll have a, a zero pressure gradient even at the outlet. Sometimes they use that, or yeah, sometimes so even they use problem dependent uh, a convection boundary condition. Uh, sorry, ma'am. It's problem dependent. I'll have a look at the problem. I'll if I look at the problem, I'll be able to tell you. Yeah. So, boundary conditions are essentially problem dependent. Yeah, so I was just wondering that is there any criterion where we can choose out of these two? That okay, this time we'll go through a pressure constant, or maybe next time I can go through zero pressure gradient, something like this. So is there we any to, some kind of criterion? To, we have to look at the problem. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Ma'am, one more question. So uh, when you're simulating this flow of Uh, through a pipe at the inlet generally it is we prescribe the velocity and the pressure is prescribed as del p is equal to zero and the outlet we say the del of u is equal to zero and p is equal to some p outlet so is there any reason why it is like that generally i mean why we don't prescribe the pressure at the inlet instead of the see uh, if you define the pressure at the typical in, in general what happens is when we simulate something we simulate the practical problem right and we know the in any experiment you can think of we know the uh, flow rate and that's why we define the flow rate at the inlet either the mass flow rate or the uniform average velocity or something right that's what we define we uh, and at the outlet what happens is we do not know the exact velocity profile right so sometimes somebody yeah, madam this yeah this is with respect to the pressure actually so I'll generally you, I'll, we, yeah i'll tell you so at, okay, at sorry, outlet we typically do not know the exact velocity profile so somebody said that somebody mentioned that can we use a mass mass flow out, out uh, outlet mass flow condition that is one way sometimes and most of the times we know the pressure so we can give a pressure pressure outlet condition if we give the pressure outlet condition it and a velocity inlet condition or mass inlet condition pressure at the inlet gets adjusted you don't have to, we don't have to define the inlet pressure again okay so only if a pressure driven flow i mean we don't have to define the inlet pressure again it gets adjusted it gets adjusted that's why we don't define the pressure inlet if we define that, inlet pressure what, we don't have to define the inlet velocity yeah that is my confusion madam like uh, you so you told that the pressure gets adjusted like i did not understand that particular point if you See, could explain that okay okay i'll just i'll show it to you from the laminar flow right using laminar flow that is easy 
So see this this equation. See pressure gradient is related to U max, and U max is of course it's the the U max is related to the R uh, the velocity profile is related to U max is here. So pressure gradient pressure and pressure gradient and the velocity profiles are related to each other, right? So now, if we know the inlet velocity profile and the outlet pressure, the inlet pressure is gets calculated. If you look at this, so U Z R is what minus partial P partial Z R square by four mu one minus R square by small R square by capital R square, right? Okay, and this, if we say that, and, and this is linear, say in case of fully developed flow. I'm just saying this. This is linear. So I'll write it delta P by L. So in delta P is P inlet minus P outlet. So if I know P outlet and if I know inlet velocity profile, inlet velocity, P inlet gets calculated. Then that's what I do. Okay? Oh, okay, ma'am. So we don't have to give the inlet. See, flow will happen because of the pressure gradient. Flow we know, outlet pressure we know, inlet pressure gets calculated. Right? Yeah. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Will we get any error if we prescribe the pressure at the inlet, like interchange, like we instead of pressure, prescribing the pressure at the outlet, along with U inlet, if we, I mean, this is general, not with respect to this example I am asking, but generally, if you uh, look at in general, I think if I mean, so outlet, you have to give a boundary condition, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, so generally uh, it is uh, uh, mentioned that uh, at the inlet you prescribe the velocity and at the outlet you prescribe the pressure. That is the most general boundary condition. Yeah, so I was trying to figure out the like answer for that. Like why is it so? Like instead can we also, why can't we prescribe the pressure also at the inlet like velocity? So if you uh, uh, see... No, if you define pressure inlet and velocity outlet. Yeah, like uh, say have the same boundary condition for the velocity. Like, like you have the U inlet and uh, delta U is equal to zero at outlet. Same thing for pressure also, like P inlet and delta P is equal so to that zero. Will, I think that will be over specified. You can try. I mean, I do not know, but I think one of the, some of the one of the boundary conditions or something will be overridden. That will be there within the code. You can try that. You know, just try and see what happens. Okay. Okay. See if you if you uh, see if you define both pressure and velocity at both inlet and outlet. I think it is. I mean, uh, it is going to be over specification. Yeah. What I was meaning was at the inlet, you say P is equal to the inlet pressure, and the outlet you specify the gradient delta P is equal to zero. Delta P is equal to zero. Nay, you can say delta P between what? Like uh, the the partial P partial Z is like equal to zero. You're just saying zero gradient at the outlet. Generally, it is the other way around. The pressure. Uh, you, I zero don't know. Pressure I, I, I actually see you cannot have the Z. See, if it is a pressure driven flow, you cannot have the. I, I can't see why how you can have a Z. I I can't see. How you can have a z delta p delta z zero? Okay, it's a that, that has to be a pressure gradient, right, for the flow to flow to happen. No, if it is a pressure driven flow, there has to be a there has to be a positive uh, pressure gradient for the flow to happen, right? I mean, negative yes, yes. pressure gradient, yeah. positive delta P for the pressure to happen, for the flow to happen, right? So I do not see uh, for a pressure driven flow how you will set the delta P delta Z zero. But what you could try to simulate, you could try and see what happens in any in, in different solvers, defining pressure inlet and pressure outlet condition, and see how the flow develops. Okay, ma'am. Yeah, that I will. Try. For example, suppose if you have already a developed flow, you know the U, U inlet, U outlet, and all these things. You know the pressure at inlet. Give that same pressure conditions and see how the flow develops. That should develop. Just check that. You can check that. Run a simulation. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, sure, ma'am. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. For a pressure driven flow, I don't see how we can give that delta P delta Z zero at the outlet. That 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 I don't think it should work. Uh, hello, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Yeah. 
and uh, thank you for your lecture ma'am i am having one doubt like all the was uh, i have seen in the fluent that uh, uh, they for bonding congestion they have mentioned that if we are creating a uh, uh, like constant density flow in compressible flow then in that case velocity in the compressor out it is the most convenient bonding that's the most common yeah but for uh, this uh, for in for compressible flow they prefer uh, mass flow rate inlet uh, at inlet boundary condition and at outlet mass flow rate outlet boundary condition mm. so here i am getting confusion so from the basic uh, conservation principle whatever the flow it's maybe a incompressible compressible or a developing or fully developed flow this mass flow rate must be conserved at both of the mm. and and outlet then why cannot be used and i have tried i have tried this mass flow rate inlet and mass flow rate outlet as, as a boundary condition for mm. for in for incompressible flow and mm. i was getting a solution which is having a kind of deviation i was not getting a correct solution so uh, i i am I means i am having this doubt so that is very specific like you no know, that is a very specific numerical question we need to check that we need to check which algorithm you are using and all ma'am uh, like whatever work. algorithm we are using if, but your question is valid you should, it, it should work we need to check that okay okay, okay. yeah okay ma'am thank you yeah. okay so uh, i think uh, we can end this session professor manaswita yeah i think so yeah okay okay thank you so much yeah. it was such a wonderful session so many queries and very much informative thanks thank a lot you.